This week on football, Gary Neville makes a darting run. On to Roy Keane calls Van Dyke arrogant. We heard Van Dyke speaking there, obviously, about, a, about arrogance coming out of him, dishing United like that. He, he needs a re- now he needs a reminder himself. He's playing for a club you want one tight in 30 odd years. Ollie Watkins singles out an abusive fan. Um, there was one individual that had been giving me abuse all game, um, kept going on to me. Um, I thought, I'm going to get him back. And the football world is in shock as Tom Lockyer collapses again. Welcome to this episode of Goalpost for Jumpers. This the last episode before Christmas, so Merry Christmas to everyone, all of our listeners. It's actually the last episode before the end of the year as well, so the last episode of 2023. So that being said, I thought I would do, at this halfway point in the season, I would do my team of the season so far. That's the Premier League team of the season so far. Let us know what you think. I've got mine. I don't think it's too controversial, but... You know, these days it's very easy to disagree with everything and anyone online. And let me just tell you, Darwin Nunes supporters, I saw you on my comments telling me that I was deluded because I was a Man United fan. And I also saw you all on Twitter bashing Darwin Nunes after the Man United Liverpool game. So don't think I haven't noticed. Okay. So my team of the season so far in goal is Vicario. At right back, I've got Pedro Porro. Centre back, I've got Van Dijk and I've got William Saliba. At left back, I've got Vitaly Mikalenko. In centre midfield, I've got Declan Rice. Alongside him, I've got Douglas Luiz. And to finish off that midfield three, I've got James Madison. Right wing, I've got Jared Bowen. Left wing, I've got Anthony Gordon. And striker is Erling Haaland. Uh, couple of reasons in there. By the way, I am going to finish off that team with my manager of the season. My manager of the season, who else could it be other than Unai Emery? The job he's done there is absolutely unbelievable. Um, I believe only Arsenal, Liverpool and City have recorded more points since Unai Emery uh, joined Villa, which is, I mean, yeah, unbelievable. I think a lot of clubs, Chelsea, Man United... A lot of big clubs would take Unai Emery, but he wouldn't go at this point, obviously, because Villa are absolutely flying and they have got a title charge on their hands, which I don't think anyone predicted at the start of the season. So in goal, Vicario. I had to go Vicario. What Tottenham have done this season, forget about all the goals they've conceded, because I'm telling you now, if Vicario wasn't in goal, they'd have conceded double. He's saving world, he's making world class saves week in, week out. And it's not just that, it's the personality of a goalkeeper. I always love either a really settled goalkeeper, who you never hear anything out of, just that calm influence, always makes the right saves, always makes the right decision, Van der Sar-esque. Or you have this big personality, Peter Schmeichel, someone like that. Vicario is that big personality. He kind of controls the box with his madness, but he's also controlling maybe a third of the pitch because of Tottenham's high line, which he has done to a level that I've only seen maybe Manuel Neuer achieve. He's hitting those levels, but he's also making those crucial, crucial saves, Um, big personality. And that's what you need when you're trying to win a title. Tottenham probably at the title race now, but uh, I think he'll be a big reason if they do make it into the Champions League, he'll be a big reason for that. Uh, Right back, I went with another Tottenham player, Pedro Porro. His criticism that he received last season, uh, some pundits were calling him the worst player they've ever seen. I remember seeing Tim Sherwood say something absolutely horrendous about him. 
But Pedro Porro this season, he's upped it a level. And then again, because he's not just an average player, he's not just a good player. He's actually my best right back in the league. Him or Kieran Trippier, I was I was kind of torn between the two. Pedro Porro for me, just because of the story, where he was, what the kind of media were talking about with him, what the pundits were saying about him. And now he's at this level, receives the ball really well, plays that right back role really well and actually takes out all of the free kicks, all of the corners for Tottenham. So we've got great delivery and on six assists for the season from a right back position, top notch, but also defensive runs, making sure that he's back defending his goal when that Tottenham line, yes, they're playing a high line, they're super disciplined, but he is a big part of why they can achieve that because Udogi, uh, Romero, Van de Ven and Pedro Parra all got great pace um, and they always make great recovery runs, particularly Van de Ven. But Pedro Porro, yeah, for his creativity, for his overall defensive performance this season, he had to go in there. Uh, Virgil van Dijk, not someone I really particularly wanted to put in there. But I think him or Ruben Diaz maybe have been the best centre-backs in our league for a while. I think van Dijk this season has not maybe achieved that 19-20 form but what he's showing now is that he's back in form. He's been out of form and he's back in form. And if Liverpool do win the league this season or if Liverpool go ahead and maybe have a title charge at the very least, he'll be a big reason for that as well because he's absolutely solid. Great playing out from the back as well. Maybe the centre-back of choice if you're ever going to pick someone. 32 years old, not necessarily in his prime. Understandably, maybe that was three years ago, but for him to achieve those levels or close to those levels now... I think it's really impressive. Uh, more impressive for me is the other centre-back, William Saliba. I think on form, he is the best centre-back in the league. I hate to say it because he's a player that I would absolutely love to have in my team. Um, Man United seems to have all the centre-back options uh, you can imagine. We've got ball-playing centre-backs. We've got aerial dual-willing centre-backs. We've got players who can be effective in the box both boxes William Saliba is everything he does everything he's got the pace of Van Dijk he's got the aerial ability of Rafa Varane he can also play as well and that is a big thing in the Arsenal side so no wonder Mikel Arteta absolutely loves him left back I've got Vitaly Mikalenko uh, I think obviously with the 10 point deduction Everton's form maybe goes under the radar because you're not looking at them as a top half team they are a top half team and uh, Mikalenko not picked at the start. Daesh didn't really fancy him at the start. You didn't see much of him. And then probably about 10 games ago, 12 games ago, you started seeing him getting back in, whether that was to do with injury or just in integrating from uh, pre-season. But since then, absolutely fantastic. A really key reason why Everton have got results and why they're keeping clean sheets as well. Uh, central midfield, I went with Declan Rice. Declan Rice is my player of the season so far. I think he has been phenomenal. For that price tag that pressure to move to Arsenal where there's a, a lot of scrutiny a lot of things have been leveled at them saying that they are bottlers for last season Declan Rice come in in the key moments not just scored goals making crucial tackles keeping the ball and actually keeping everything ticking over I think he's an all-round midfielder box-to-box -box midfielder and he's showing that he can come up with goals in crucial moments which is something again that's been he's been maybe criticized not criticized but said why why can't Declan Rice be the best midfielder in the world? Well, maybe he doesn't get the goals. He is getting the goals this season. He's been the player of the year for me so far. Uh, Douglas Louise alongside him made really good steps over the last two seasons since Unai Emery's come in. I think we're seeing the player that obviously Arsenal wanted. A lot of people maybe didn't say that he was Brazilian quality, that, you know, this isn't a Brazilian player. I don't recognise him as, as that, but he has got that technique. He has got that ability from set pieces. He's got a little bit of flair, um, but not just that. He's a dogged defender, loves getting back, winning the ball, making tackles as well. So I had to go in there. Uh, yes, James Madison was my other. Now, if James Madison didn't get injured at a crucial point, let's be honest, in Spurs' campaign for the title, I think we'd have seen Spurs a lot closer to that title race. Really unfortunate that him and Van de Ven got injured at the time they did. But James Madison, for me, at the point where he got injured, was the best player in the league. And I think most people would agree with that. There's a reason why I've had to put him in, and that is that reason. Now, obviously, he's been injured for maybe six or seven games. A large portion of the season, understandable if you don't agree with him being in there. But I think for the 11, maybe 12 games that he did play this season, I thought he was the best player in the league. Every single week, week in, week out, turning up was the best player on the pitch. 
I couldn't miss him out. I think he's been brilliant and a real shame to see him injured. Hopefully he's back stronger in the new year. At right wing, I've gone with Jared Bowen. Had to put him in there. He has hit another level of form, obviously away from home. He scored eight goals away from home this season and it's December. Mental. The hardest, most tough environments for him to perform. Away grounds, intimidating atmospheres. Europa Conference League finals he steps up he's a big moment player not really integrated himself into that England squad doesn't seem to fully fit in yet but I think from his Premier League form absolutely undeniable I don't know a right winger better maybe Salah this season but I think even if you ask Liverpool fans they would say Salah's been off the boil his uh, his statistics brilliant but performances don't know about Jared Bowen's goals, crucial. And West Ham, obviously, pottering along in the league, doing well, considering they've got that European football as well. Jared Bowen's a big reason for that. Yeah, record. Uh, I think he got a record equaling uh, away goal record, equaling Van Persie, I believe. Um, but I think off the back of that Europa Conference League winner, there was something that sparked in him. I mean, not that he necessarily has lacked belief. He doesn't look like he lacks belief. But maybe did he ever think, oh, I belong at this stage, maybe a Premier League player, but at this stage, and that stage is one of the best forwards, not just in the league, but maybe in the world as well. And Jared Bowen, absolutely flying, love him. Left wing, Anthony Gordon. Uh, Again, another player that is probably under the radar a little bit, and then something big happens to him, and then you see the stature grow. And I think that under 21 Euros in the summer, becoming the player of the tournament and winning the tournament... I think that has really kicked him on, given him that belief that at Newcastle he can be a big, big player, not just in the league, but also in Europe as well. And we've seen that. His performance has been fantastic. I think if we're looking at an England side in the uh, in the Euros next summer, is he your left winger? He might be. He might be pushing out Rashford in that squad, in my opinion. And that's coming from a Man United fan. Uh, striker, I went with Erling Haaland. 14 goals, the league's top goal scorer. Obviously, we can say... You know, City aren't really hitting the heights that they did last season. Very difficult for them to do that. But Erling Haaland still hitting 14 goals, 15 games, four assists as well. Um, So, yeah, ahead of the nearest goal scorer by three goals as well. And people would probably say, has Haaland been that great? His goal record speaks for itself. Could not not put him in there. There's an, obviously a, a shout for Ollie Watkins. But when you've scored, you know, five or six goals more than the next striker in Ollie Watkins... I, 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 can't, I can't leave him out. So Erling Haaland's in that and that makes up my uh, team of the season so far. Let me know what you think. Let us know. The next thing I am going to do is I'm going to give you my team of the week. My team of the week, uh, I struggled to watch a lot of football this week. I was out and about, but I did manage to make it to a Bristol City game. So you'll see a couple of Bristol City players in this team of the week. So I apologise. But yes, my team of the week in goal, Max O'Leary of Bristol City. Right back, Connor Chapman of Melbourne Victory. Centre-back Ben Davis at Tottenham. Another centre-back is Rafa Varane at Man United. Left-back Cameron Pring of Bristol City. Central midfield, Kobe Maino of Man United. I've gone Zinedine Mashash at Melbourne Victory. And then alongside him is Kiernan Jewsbury Hall at Leicester. Uh, right wing, I've gone Dejan Kulisevsky at Tottenham. I've gone left wing, Steffi Mavadidi at Leicester. And striker, I've gone Harry Kane of Bayern Munich. Um, yeah, Max O'Leary, great saves when I watched him in the week for, for Bristol City, kept a clean sheet. Connor Chapman, I love, there's some fullbacks that have been brilliant in the A-League. He's one of them, great going up and down. Seemed to be everything that he touched turned to gold when I watched him play this week. Um, yeah, fantastic. Ben Davis, quality player. Probably disappointed not to get the man of the match in the Tottenham game, but I think he was close. Uh, Varane, maybe one of the only players that can hold their head high after that Liverpool Man United game, a really poor performance from pretty much everyone on the pitch. Thought Varane was good. Uh, Cameron Pring for Bristol City. Again, a clean sheet for him. Really difficult task up against um, Patrick Roberts of Sunderland. Thought he coped with him really well. Kobe Maynou for such a young lad. You know, I think he's like third or fourth start for Man United. Third start and away at Anfield and it didn't just look like he belonged there. I thought, you know, Maybe one of the better players until he got substituted as well. Uh, Zinedine Machash, anyone who hasn't seen him, um, named after Zinedine Zidane, but plays for Melbourne Victory. Frenchman, 
scored a really good goal, got an assist as well. Thought he was brilliant all game. One of my favourite players that I've seen so far in the A-League this season. Uh, Kiernan Drewsbury Hall. I think maybe uh, a lot of people probably criticised, myself included, Gabby Agbon Lahore for saying he'd take him over Kovacic. Uh, look, Kovacic is a Man City. Drewsbury Hall's in the Championship, of course. But it's no comparison, but Drewsbury Hall this season has been absolutely fantastic. Scored, got an assist, um, was really good in, in that Leicester victory over Birmingham. Um, right wing Dejan Kulisevsky thought he was really good for Tottenham got the goal um, also got a great assist for Richarlison and ultimately winning the game uh, Steffi Mavadidi another player that really impressed me has really impressed me all season loved watching him at Montpellier I watched a lot of French football when he was there um, and always stood out to me never really made it at Juve when he got that big move from Arsenal but yeah, he's really, really pulling up trees in Leicester, at Leicester this season. And if, again, if they're going to win the title, it'll be down to those wingers. Mavadidi's been brilliant. Jewsby Hall's been brilliant. But also Fatawu on that right wing. Really, really interesting player. They're so dangerous. But Mavadidi, the calmness, the coolness, the finish. He had that. Got two goals against Birmingham. Um, and again, another tough away game for Leicester. But they saw it through. Harry Kane up top, two goals for Bayern as they put Stuttgart away. Had to be in there. Top class player, top class striker, the best striker in the world. And he's English. Love it. Okay, right, guys, that is my team of the week on to Two Lies and a Truth. So Two Lies and a Truth is the part of the show where I give you three stories, three crazy stories in the world of football. Two are lies, one is true. You have to guess which one is true. Starting off with story number one. A game in Azerbaijan was interrupted after a kit man named Hagrid was taken ill. Story number two. Romanian authorities had to step in to stop a fourth division side building a crocodile infested moat around the pitch. Or is it story number three? Arsenal have admitted in a club statement they sold a season ticket to the Sky Sports team Back in 2016, which has been used over 50 times by Gary Neville. Those are your three stories. One of them is true. You've got to guess. I'll tell you at the end of the show. Make sure you stay tuned. Up next is TikTok submissions. The last TikTok submissions of the year. Let's make it a good one. I can actually feel that. No, I know. And I can feel it. Money, it? Barely even, you barely touched it, though, did you? You barely even touched it. No, I went like that. And yeah. literally, I can feel that. Yeah. yeah, just like a bit. There you go, couldn't actually speak there. Very true. Yeah, yeah, sure. All right. Did you used to play around here? You, did you grow up around here? I grew up in um, Golders Green. Okay, Finch, yeah. Finchley. Okay. Um, played football as a boy. Yeah. Um, I can see that. Thanks. Um, but obviously, don't get much of a chance to play anymore. No. So even doing this is a joy. Yeah. What are we uh, for? Just a just like a clean three or four touches me, three or four touches you. Nice. Perfect. Perfect. That might be the one. Okay. Should we keep it going? Okay. Yes. Whilst this is lovely, why is the guy in full shirt and tie and Adidas joggers? This is a compilation of Gabriel Obertan, one of Man United's worst ever signings, maybe. So I think there was someone in the squad that said he was the quickest player they've ever seen. Never made it at Man United, never really made it in Newcastle either. A lot of people compare signings like that to the likes of Anthony. What Anthony is going through at the moment, it's not that he's a bad player. I'm not having that Anthony's a bad player. What Anthony's going through at the moment at Man United is just a horrendous patch of form but it's not that he's a bad player. And I think anyone who does watch Man United week in, week out and watches them with a keen eye, Anthony's ability in terms of tracking back on the ball, progressing play out from the back is really, really good. The problem with him and where we look at most wingers nowadays are scoring like 15, 20 goals a season. He's not going to do that. He hasn't got that ability. I think he's a fantastic player and I actually think he would work really well 
in a 2012 side or a 2008 side. He's got bags of ability, great on the ball, really great defensively, really disciplined, but he's not going to go and bag you 20 goals a season. And I think that's where our standards have been unfairly raised because the likes of Mo Salah and Kylian Mbappe and Ronaldo and Messi playing from those right and left wings. We're not... We haven't got a player like that. We've got a player who actually is really talented going through a bad patch of form. I think he's still got, you know, five or 10 goals a season in him. If he learns how to get into the right positions, if United end up going through a better patch of form themselves, I think a lot of the poor form from the players is just a symptom of the whole overall toxicity of the club. Anthony's a good player. Anthony is a very good player. And I will die on that sword because I'm seeing something, maybe something slightly different to everyone else. People are so focused on goals and assists these days. I'm watching the guy every single week and I'm seeing a player who's great on the ball. Like I said, great working the ball from defence to attack as well. But that final third thing as a winger is one of your main things you're judged by. So, of course, people will criticise him for that. I think that will come but defensively you can't argue with him he's brilliant and I don't think that partnership with Dallow works I think Anthony and wan is the two that you want to play there and not having Dallow at right back wan is a much better player um, and Anthony yeah once once United start to hit form I think he'll start to hit, hit form I think it's just a symptom of Man United like I said the toxicity of the club at the moment Gabriel Obertan here what a nightmare of a signing how many times have you sent off? Not that many. Oh, I think seven, go seven or eight. The first one was the FA Cup semi-final, Villa Park, sent off for a stamp on Gareth Southgate. Yeah, and he deserved it. He <laughs> said <laughs> so the defenders never be on your back, you know what yeah. I mean? Always be on your feet. Yeah. Second one, 1995, August 28th, early in the season, Blackburn at Ewood Park, dismissed in an ill-tempered I was unlucky match. with that one. <laughs> no, I was. That was two yellow cards. Watching this Roy Keane video reminds me of this week. I'm pretty sure I saw a group of guys on a podcast say that Roy Keane wasn't one of the best midfielders we've seen in the league, saying that like these average players are way better than that he wouldn't survive. Roy Keane's one of the Roy Keane is one of the best midfielders I've ever seen in my life, not just in the Premier League, in the world. In terms of standards that he set for himself, game in, game out, week in, week out, and what he set for the rest of the players, that then grew into what the club and the rest of the squad had as their standards. So from a captain's point of view, brilliant. But on the ball, unbelievable passer of the ball. Brilliant first touch, could go box to box, could defend, could attack, could score goals, could score goals in the air with his left foot, with his right foot. He's a finisher and one of the best box to box midfielders I've, I've ever seen. And yeah, unbelievable captain as well to, to go with it, had the personality what a player Roy Keane was. Definitely had loads of red cards, though, so I don't know what he's pretending that he didn't have loads for. Commissioner did this in an argument over a pasty. This man was run over with a mobility scooter after he reportedly bought the last pasty in a bakery. The hangry rider had his wheels seized and police had to ride it back to the station. The funniest thing, the funniest thing about that is the police officer having to ride that mobility scooter all the way to the police station. Doesn't live that down, does he? Dave Martin oh, said like women that ain't shouldn't be commentating or talking about football, punditing on football, not nothing. And you you ain't having that. No. Why? What qualifies you as a pundit? Uh, if if you're talking presenting, that's different. You've got to go for all the qualifications. But as a pundit, it's what the producer. I, how I see it is a producer will have a, an ex player because you know former players or whatever. They they will like their personality or opinion because not everybody that talks about football, they don't articulate the game perfectly. Mm -hmm. Right? Football has always been about opinions for one. But two, not everybody is an analyst, right? They're personalities. So football and, and everything, YouTube and everything is now about that. Mm. And it's what the producer likes, right? So why doesn't it, if we played the game... The only thing that I would agree with him <coughs> on is that there's a few things. There's Obviously, the physicality is completely different. Is the woman's, he the said the woman's game, so he said the woman's game is a different sport altogether. It's not a different sport, but it's a completely different game in, in terms of how it's played. And I say that to you all the time. You can't mm. compare the men's and women's games. But the rules are the same. I agree. They're the same and the tactics are the same. Our games are nowhere near your game. I couldn't go on a pitch with you guys and compete. No the way. Premier League's nowhere near League but Two either. Yeah, but I couldn't go and but they could compete. Mm. Physically they can compete. Men can compete with men. Mm. We couldn't as a female, I say it to you all the time, yeah. I can't go on that. 
and, and play with you guys and, and, and look okay. I'd look rubbish. Completely mm. rubbish. I'll be out of my depth. Bruv, I'll be out of my depth. And I understand <laughs> that I'll be out of my depth. I'm not naive or stupid to mm. think that. But when it comes to talking tactics, I grew up watching a men's game. I grew up going to Stamford Bridge every single week from the age of five. So mm. you learn the game. The only the only visibility of football was men. Mm. So to say females wouldn't have learned the men's game by watching it is a bit stupid. I don't mm. like his we angle anyway. He's not coming for and the likes of Ian Dark. He's not coming for he's like Clive Tilton. Why, why, are, why, are, yeah, why are these guys allowed <laughs> to commentate without any sort of professional background in the game? Mm. No, I think he's he's choosing his targets with, with an angle. Uh, I think Farrah Williams is pretty bang on with that. I, th- I there's a there's the angle that. Joey Barton is wrong that say in saying that you can, look. She's right mentally and physically is two different things. Farrah Williams is bang on. She couldn't compete with them in the men's game in League Two or in Premier League, like she's saying. She's admitting that. And it, do you know what? If a lot of the women's game supporters would admit that, it would go a long way. But they don't. But she's bang on with that. Um, but what she's saying, growing up, watching the game, reading the game, why couldn't a female do that as well as a man? I don't know why. And that's what Joey Barton's going for. What Joey Barton is also going for, where I think he is right, which they don't mention, is it's tokenism. It's putting women in there for the sake of it. So there, I think he has an argument because just statistically there's more men involved in football than women but then we see a 50 50 split on our screens every every single week and sometimes 70 30 sometimes even more i don't mind women being in the game but don't put them in there for the sake of it and that's all that's all that i would say i think jerry barton goes too deep on it but don't put people into jobs that other people have been trying for would be desperate for who deserve it don't put them in there just because of their race, their skin color, their ethnicity. Don't put it put them in there just because they're female. Put them in there because they're best for the job. And that is the same for anything in the world. Put someone in who's best in class. If you're Sky Sports, you want to be the best organization. Don't put someone like Eni Aluko on TV. She's not good enough. She's actually shocking. And Eni Aluko is a racist. She's openly racist. And we have to put up with her every week. That's not someone we want to see. I'll put, I'll take Farrah Williams over her all day of the week and I will not complain. Put someone in there because they deserve it, not because of their race, their ethnicity or their gender. It's ridiculous. So yeah, Farrah Williams is bang on there. Um, but also there's a hint of truth to Joey Barton stuff. Or reason for coming here? Well, um, of course, it's one of, the, one of the things is the money, of course. You cannot hide that. Um, but when we see the project, and, and I know um, more, m- a lot of people think we, we say this because just to say it, but it's not true. Uh, when they present us the project, it's, it's a very, very big project. I think people have no idea how the country is uh, improving and how the football is improving in here and how the football can be in, uh, in a few years. So in one year, we did this um, in Saudi Pro League. Yeah. So I believe in two two more years, three more years, that will be uh, uh, amazing. Uh, Ruben Neves there talking about moving to the Saudi league. I love that he openly says that he went there for money. The, the idea that he or any of the footballers don't go there for money is ridiculous. Of course they do. And there is nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with taking a job for more money. Every single person in life does that. 99% of people do that. If you're in a job working for... McDonald's and they offer you a job in a McDonald's across the road that's an extra three pound an hour but it's the same job you're gonna do it and then do you get into the ethics of that company like everyone wants to rip apart the Saudi league and talk about the ethics of the country what about the ethics of our own country what about the ethics of McDonald's and the way they treat animals we don't talk about it but we like to stand and sit on our pedestal and say, oh, you, you're you wrong. You know, it's very easy to say that when you're not part of the system. If you get offered 800 grand a week and you are just a person listening right now, are you turning that down? You're not. You're going to you're gonna compromise on whatever little ethics or morals that you've got, like anyone does in regular life just to get by. These guys, yes, are in a load of money in the Premier League or wherever, and it's enough. But these guys can literally go, okay, so you're telling me I spent three years out here promoting the league and then I can go back to European football. 
But in that space of time, I'll have looked after my family for probably two generations. My kids, my grandkids. Tell me you're not taking that. You're lying if you say you're not. You're absolutely lying. And Ruben Neves, I think I believe him on that there's a big project. And I actually do think the Saudi League will progress and progress to a high standard. I don't believe that he went there for the project. I think he's gone there for the paycheck. And there's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong with that as far as I'm concerned. Do you miss me? Do you want me? You don't miss me. You still want me. Check it out. Check it out. Why is it that we're so okay with watching kids get hit with a football and laughing? Because it's funny and I don't know why we're okay with it. Why is it so satisfying? Amazon Kitchen Finds. This looks like a bus, but when you open the lid and fill it with eggs, it helps keep them organised in your fridge or freezer. This or instead of getting an egg bus, you just put it in the carton that's already made for it. But sure. This cat has a flexible design, so when you place him on a surface, it works as a trivet. This kitten has a suction cup on the back to stick to your sink so it can hold your sponge. And this looks like a crocodile, but when you open its mouth and add some vegetables, you can use him to slice, dice, and grate to save you hours while meal prepping. Uh, that was actually quite cool. I like the crocodile. Not sure about the cat theme. I, I hate cats. Amazon Kitchen Finds. These magic beans clean your bottle when you shake them around inside with soapy water. This microwave pasta cooker has everything you need to cook a bowl of pasta in minutes. You can cook up to six portions, the lid doubles as a strainer, and you can use it to mix the pasta before serving. Okay, that is the best product I've seen on any of these ever. Not sure about putting it in a plastic thing and put it in the microwave all the time. Not sure about that. But in terms of quickness can't argue with that that's sick then this product can help it rotates around in your fridge so you can get to the sauces at the back this is a citrus rimmer that looks like an octopus and can plug stuff too this lemon juicer has this hinge design to extract all the juice this peeler catches the peel inside this compartment so it's easy to throw out this is a thin ice tray which makes ice cubes that can fit into any size bottle or can this is an ice cream scoop which has a circular design so it makes the perfect ice cream sandwich i want that too i want that these are oven liners, which catch food that falls off in your oven, so you never have to clean your oven floor. Hold on, as ever with these videos, there's always something weird. Was there a tub of ice cream in his oven just then? Perfect ice cream sandwich. These are oven liners, which catch food that falls off in your oven, so you never have to clean your oven floor. This is the fry wall. It goes on your pan when you're cooking and stops oil spitting onto your kitchen and face. This pair of scissors has five blades to chop herbs, vegetables and pasta super quick. I've done it again. Why is he chopping pasta? Why? Why do I feel like I should know that that's a normal thing to chop pasta and maybe I'm being an idiot now and pasta chopping is normal? Why would you chop it with five scissors? This electric butter sprayer will melt your butter and spray it over your cookware, cereal and bread. This no. is an upright... No! Go back. Right, there's a few things we need to unpack here. And I'm just going to go back a second and listen. First, starting with the weird scissors that he's chopping pasta with. Chop herbs, vegetables and pasta super quickly. This electric butter sprayer will melt your butter and spray it over your cookware, cereal and bread. The guy is spraying butter on his cereal. Is there something that I don't know? Do I try it? Perfectly cooked waffle every time and because it's upright, there is never any mess. Cool. I, I, yeah, they're all cool products, but stop spraying butter on your pasta and pasta on your chopping pasta and your cereal. I don't think he did any of that, but it seemed confused. He probably could have gone on and like won a Ballon d'Or. That's how good he was. Like he never, he, like he was so strong on the ball. And all the players that's played with him, when I speak to them about the, about him, they're like, Jay, he's the best. My opinion, Dembele. Dembele. Say what Deli Ali said. It's unbelievable. Uh, the goat. The goat. I'm going to put Dembele. Wow. Of course, you can say Messi, you can say Ronaldo, but yeah. this guy, when I played with him at Tottenham, yeah. is the goal. Really? He's a monster and he's got ballerina feet at the same time. Moussa Dembele was probably the best player I've ever seen play football. Funny. Admiration for a fellow midfielder, and Moussa Dembele is sometimes a bit of an unsung hero uh, for Tottenham, but he's a fabulous footballer. Yeah. Yeah. Guys, talking about Moussa Dembele of Tottenham there, and I don't want to be one of those bandwagon people or someone who says it after the fact me and my friend Dave and I know Dave listens 
me and Dave, when Dembele was like at Tottenham and nobody used to talk about him, me and Dave used to absolutely love him. We said he was the best player in the league. Like genuinely, we would say he is the best player in the league. He was six foot, big, strong, quick, could cover distance, could run, could dribble, could tackle, could defend. The only thing with Dembele, I think if he had scored a few more goals, maybe if he was like on a five or six goal a season thing, maybe people would have rated him a little bit higher, but he didn't really have that end product of goals and assists. But all round game, I don't, you can't disagree. Carl Walker there is saying that he is the best player he's ever played with. And this is a guy who's played with the best, as in Wayne Rooney for England, Harry Kane for England, and then at Man City, Aguero, De Bruyne, David Silva, and he thinks Dembele's better. That says a lot. What a player Moussa Dembele was. And actually, I heard something quite similar about Etienne Capou, or Etienne Capoue, at Tottenham and at Watford, where players said that if he wanted to, he could be next level in terms of his, he had an engine. He was the best athlete they've ever played with. And obviously you see now he's playing still at a high level in Spain. And I think he's 30, was he 35, 36 and still going. So obviously that shows that he had that, he had that ability physically, but apparently he was an absolute beast and people always talk, you know, not necessarily positively about him but apparently he was one of the best players at at both clubs Tottenham and and Watford guys that was TikTok submissions and the last one of the year thank you so much for all your submissions this year it's been amazing um really enjoyed doing them really enjoyed the Amazon home finds to the couple of people who have been sending sending me them uh, really enjoying doing them so keep them coming in the new year right let's do around Europe going around Europe is basically my way of telling you and filling you in with all the little things that have happened in Europe's top five leagues I say top five leagues, more top four, and then a little bit of Portugal and a little bit of Netherlands. Starting with Spain, Bellingham scored again uh, as Real Madrid beat Villarreal 4-1. It wasn't enough to stay top of the league, um, but because of the story that's developing, Girona recorded their 14th win of the season already. They are now top. The only thing with Girona that stops it being a fairy tale story is the fact they're owned by the Man City group. That City group owning them just... I d- look, from a, a purely footballing point of view, amazing what they're doing to, to be on top of that league when you've got Barca, Real Madrid, you've got Atletico Madrid, you've got all these great sides. But there's something about it that feels... ah, You know, if, you know when Leicester won the league... And it was a massive shock and everyone was like, wow. And it was like, you could really get behind the manager, the club. They were doing it on a low budget. It's something about the City group and the way it works with all the charges. I don't know. That's just me. I hope, I actually do hope they win, win it be just for, purely for the spectacle. Um, but there's some really good players in that side. Obviously, Daley Blin used to play at Man United. He's at centre-back for Girona, which is crazy. He's still going. I think it is time that we start talking about the Ukrainian striker Artem Dovbik because he's just grabbed his ninth and 10th goal of the season already. And he has four assists as well in La Liga. This is his debut season in La Liga in Spain. He was at Dnipro previously bagging banging in goals he did as a as a younger lad he came from Dnipro um different Dnipro went away to Denmark really really struggled came back to Dnipro in Ukraine scored a load of goals and then got his big move at the age of 25 26 first season in the league and his team is top of the table and he's the second top goal scorer in the league absolutely amazing stuff magical stuff uh, it's worth keeping an eye out for him as well um Right, and what else has happened? Well, Barca were held away at Valencia. Getafe are picking up form, uh, and so are Bilbao. In fact, they won. They beat uh, Atletico Madrid on the weekend. They're absolutely flying as well. That's a really close battle between Atletico Madrid and and Athletic Bilbao. There is, I think, only a couple of points between them in that fourth spot race. Um, so I'd be interested to see those two clubs. I do love the whole story of Bill Bauer. For anyone who doesn't know, they only sign and only play players in the Basque region. So everyone's Spanish and everyone is from that Basque region. The fact that they've never been relegated. And again, they're pushing for a top four place. One of the best stories in football and one of the most unheard of stories in football because nobody really talks about it. It's amazing. 
at the bottom of La Liga, Almeria still haven't won a game of football. Uh, in Germany, Kane double uh, put Stuttgart away. Uh, Munich won comfortably. They won 3-0. Leverkusen also showed that they are strong enough to keep up and not just keep up. They are still top of the league. They won 3-0 as well. They beat Frankfurt to remain top of the table. It's going to be a crazy race. Look, Bayern probably will end up nicking it. But the way Leverkusen are going, they've just... That Leverkusen win, by the way, is the 21st win they've recorded this season. It's just insane what Alonso's doing there. Absolutely incredible. Outside of that title race now, probably uh, you've got Leipzig. They're there or thereabouts. They're keeping up with the leading pack. They won 3-1 at home to Hoffenheim. Dortmund, probably, I think they can say that their uh, title push hopes are probably over. They had a strong start. They were keeping up a little bit, but they were held away at Augsburg this weekend. It means there's 13 points between uh, Alonso's Leverkusen and Dortmund, I don't think that's going to be uh, something they can they can catch. Not with the form. They they were obviously very strong. I like like what they did in the Champions League. Um, to a certain extent, they had a couple of good performances, a couple of good results against the big teams. But it's just so hard when you do that title push, it's particularly when you're you know a side like Dortmund, where you don't you can't compete with the resources of Bayern Munich. And you put up with it all season and you nearly get it. And right at the death, you don't, you don't. Then also that next season is always going to be a little bit lower in terms of what you can achieve because you've put so much into the season before. But maybe top four should, shouldn't be a problem for them. Kane, by the way, now on 20 Bundesliga goals for the season already. He's only played 14 games. It's absolutely astonishing stuff from Harry Kane. In France, Mbappe's goal, only enough for a point uh, away at Lille for PSG. Uh, But in the shock result in that division, actually in probably all of the leagues, Nice, who were on that amazing run of not conceding any goals, they conceded three away at Le Havre. And that is a real shame because PSG dropping points meant that they could have capitalised on that maybe grabbed a couple of points, but now that gap has opened up. It's now five points between PSG and Nice. Uh, Monaco also couldn't capitalise. Again, a real shame. They were beaten to... They were beaten by Lyon. I said last week, Lyon, when they when they beat Toulouse 3-0, I thought maybe that is the start for them. Maybe they can just use that confidence to go on. And obviously beating Monaco is a huge feat, you know, in considering where they were, Lyon, and where Monaco are this season. To grab that result is absolutely amazing. They are now off the bottom of the table as well. So, yeah, nothing else really crazy in France other than Lyon winning. In Italy, Juve drew away at Genoa. That gave into the chance to go clear at the top by four points, which they took. They won 2-0 away at Lazio in Rome. Two goals, the goals from Marcus Turam and Lautaro Martinez. Probably the most dangerous strike partnership in the world at the moment, those two. I've seen quite a few inter games where they haven't quite agreed on the pitch. They've fallen out on the pitch, but they seem to love playing with each other. I think Lautaro Martinez is that sort of player that does that he can play in a two a two kind of double striker role like he did with Lukaku like we used to see with York and Cole and the likes but Lautaro Martinez seems to relish playing in that that role and he's got Marcus Turan alongside him really big move for Turan this season to go to Inter but he seems to be absolutely fine with the pressure Milan showed that they're not completely out of it they won 3-0 They beat Monza. Uh, But the surprise package of the season for me, which I haven't really noticed, they've crept up on me. Uh, Bologna, they brush aside Mourinho's Roma 3-0 to go fourth in the league. That takes them ahead of last season's winners, Napoli, Fiorentina and Roma themselves. So, you know, I've, I've watched a lot of Italian football. I've seen Bologna maybe once or twice. They've been okay, nothing special, but they're up to fourth. So, yeah, a massive achievement for them considering, I think I've mentioned Josh Shirksy there. He's he's really flourishing there, but not really anything else. And then, obviously, I've looked at their results and they've just been absolutely flying. So, yeah, congratulations to them. Everywhere else in the Dutch division, PSV showed the difference between them and the best of the rest. They beat Alkmaar 4-0. Feyenoord also won 4-0 to keep the gap down to only 10 points. I mean, I say only 10 points at this start at this stage of the season, but I don't think PSV are getting caught from there. Uh, only surprising thing really in that 
was that Santiago Jimenez wasn't on the score sheet, uh, even though there was four goals for for Feyenoord. But uh, yeah, he remains top scorer in that division alongside Vangelis Pavlidis. Uh, Ajax picked up another point. They're now up to fifth. That is a big shock. They were shocking at the start of the season, couldn't get a win. Now they're all of a sudden fifth. Uh, don't think they're going to have any chance of the title. I mean, even top four might be a push because there is a big gap. Um, where there isn't a big gap is in Portugal. The top four all played each other. Now, I've been speaking about this for a couple of weeks now, saying that it's going to be one of the best divisions, best title races um, of the year. And it showed it. I mean, this, this weekend was a massive, massive weekend. We had Braga playing Benfica and we had Porto playing Sporting. Well, there was a single goal from Danish striker Kasper Tengsted, which was enough for Benfica to beat Braga. The man in form, Victor Gjokerez, was the difference for Sporting against Porto. They won 2-0. He got a goal and an assist. Sporting lead the way with 34 points. That's one point ahead of Benfica. Porto and Braga on 31 points and 29 points, respectively. Still a long way to go, but... Massive weekend for, for Portuguese football and the title race is still bang on. Right, let's do our two lies and a truth answer. The first story was a game in Azerbaijan was interrupted after a kit man named Hagrid was taken ill. Story number two was Romanian authorities had to step in to stop a fourth division side building a crocodile infested moat around their pitch. And then there was story number three. Story number three was Arsenal have admitted in a club statement they sold a season ticket to the Sky Sports team back in 2016, which has been used over 50 times by Gary Neville. Three stories. One of them was true. Which one was it? (laughs) It was story number two. That was Romanian authorities. They had to step in to stop a fourth division side building a crocodile infested moat around their pitch. This was to stop pitch invaders apparently and the club president said that they were going to put a moat around the pitch they had planning permission to put a moat around the pitch and then fill it with crocodiles man eating crocodiles they had a whole plan but then authorities apparently got got involved and stopped it from happening i would have loved to see that happen okay guys finally Thank you so much for all your support this year. It's been crazy being back. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. And I know I say this, but genuinely, we appreciate every single listen, every single view, every single like. Literally, if five people listen to our show every week, we would be dead happy. We'd at least be doing it for some people. So we absolutely love doing it for ourselves as well. But knowing that a few people listen is great. So thank you so much. If you haven't already subscribed on YouTube, go ahead. You'll see all of our video episodes. We know predominantly a lot of you do just listen, but go ahead to our YouTube channel to see my face and Baker's face. If you haven't already got in touch with us on social media, give us suggestions. Tell us that we're stupid. Tell us we're ugly. It's absolutely fine. We love it. All sorts of Uh, contributions to the show are appreciated and we are going to be looking for new TikTok submitters so people to send in content that I react to as well so make sure you get in touch. As I said at the top of the show this is the last episode of the year the last episode of 2023 you'll hear from me in the new year so make sure you stay tuned for that small break for us and then we're back straight on it every Wednesday going forward from there. We will see you in 2024. I'm going to leave you with all of this season's best bits so far. Hello, everyone. It's Alex here from Goalpost TV. We are back. And if you're not sure who we are, we're the guys responsible for this. On to Women's Corner. Uh, This is the best part of the episode, guys. Has anyone seen Joe Linton's son? This is the wildest game I've ever seen. I hope this is not a family game. (laughs) How the dragon looks like he's about to sneeze at all times. How the dragon looks a fifth of the way through a sneeze. You get nothing out of this. Nothing. At all. What's he trying to do? Who's he trying to impress? John McGinn is the most overrated central midfielder in the league. Man United will finish above Tottenham this season, I guarantee it. Waiting to strike, almost like a cobra. You've been pronouncing this word wrong your whole life. (laughs) (laughs) 
Odegaard can't even get in the Swedish national team. It might help if he was Swedish, but he's not. He's Norwegian, so get your facts right, mate. Come on, Wednesday! This is so funny. Unacceptable. You, you literally... It's not even a good podcast. 